Hello, everyone. My name is Cicely Lewis, and welcome to the Candle Week Read Along. I'm your host, the 2020 National School Librarian of the Year, and the founder of a program called Read Woke. Read Woke is a program that I initiated in my school in Meadow Creek High School in North Cross, Georgia, so that my students could have access to books that provide windows and mirrors, as the term was coined by Dr. Bishop. I use this program to bring students in connection with books and to bring authors to the forefront who had previously not been given consideration. And the results have been amazing. And I'm so excited today to say that the first 10 registrants of the Read Walk program will receive free copies of books to join the Read Along. And I'm so excited to say that we are joined by the author of our first pick for the Read Along, the Candlewick Read Along, Frederick Joseph. And the first pick is The Black Friend. And I'm just going to tell you now, this book is a must read. So I, I'm just so excited to have Mr. Joseph here today, and I'm going to allow him to introduce himself. Hi, Frederick Joseph. <laughs> hey, Cicely. Um, it's a pleasure to be talking with you. Um, you know, so I'll give people a little bit of background on me. Um, so obviously, um, I wrote the book that I'm honored that you enjoyed, um, uh, The Black Friend. Uh, and outside of um, being the author of that book, um, I'm also um, a marketer um, who's done a myriad of things. Um, I've received the Forbes Under 30 Award for Marketing, um, Ad Age, um, Marketers of the Year, um, Route 100, Influential African Americans, um, Humanitarian of the Year, so on and so forth. Um, but generally, I'm just someone who enjoys writing um, and trying to educate and learn along the way. Wow. And and that that doesn't that description doesn't even give all the credit that this uh, man deserves. And if you want to know more about him and his journey and be enlightened every day, follow him on Twitter like I am. I'm learning every day, and it's just an amazing journey. This this book was such a powerful tool that I feel it it really needs to be in our curriculum, in our libraries, in our home libraries. And I'm just so excited that you're here today to, to share some insight um, in the book. And I have a few questions that I just want to have a conversation with you because this, this book really, I, I knew a lot of the things in the book already, but I'd never seen some of these put down into print. And I think sometimes you feel isolated when you when you have these experiences and then to see them articulated so well by you it makes you think wow i wasn't crazy um in particular the situation in the beginning of the book when you you visited a friend's house and prior to that you had had relatively no real discussions about race or anything and then to get to the house and the the encounter that occurred and how that impacted you. Could you just share a little bit about that experience and, and what you hope readers can gain from the book and all the experiences that you've articulated? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think that was the general goal in writing the book. You know, my personality is very much that I try to create things um, that don't exist or at least support others who are working on creating them as well. And in the anti-racist conversations about general racism space, you know, I, I saw that there was a, a lack of microaggression conversation taking place, like real firsthand experiences. You know, I, I think with um, what was done with, for instance, like Stamped or, um, you know, other books in that realm, it gives context and kind of like historical uh, placement of how we got here. Um, but what I wanted to create was, this is how this impacts me, right? This is what it feels like to be the black person in a white space um, and you're the only one there or what it feels like um, to be the black person and someone's touching your hair, right? You know, I can say, oh, it's wrong, but it's a very different thing to actually have a conversation and, and try to build empathy, right? Because if you just tell somebody something something's wrong all the time, you know, I, I don't know that that always works in the same way as giving real 
firsthand experiences um, to build understanding. Wow. And, you know, a lot of Black people are going to be thankful because, you know, with everything that's been happening recently, I've been seeing a lot of people tweet, I'm so exhausted explaining everything as the Black person. I'm the only Black person in my office, so I have to explain, like you said, why it's not okay to just touch my hair. This is, in, in the back of the book, it calls this a conversation starter, a toolkit. This is a toolkit that you can give to educate anyone. And like you said, it's, I think it's really going to help bridge the gap because we do need to just stop telling people, hey, this is not right, but give them information. And then everybody might not feel like doing that. So um, that's one of the reasons why. And, and I also had a question about all of the amazing interviews. Angie Thomas, she's one of my favorite young adult writers. She's a fellow Mississippian. When I saw her interview here, and I also saw uh, Jamel Hill, and like all of the people that, that I love and I'm fans of, what out of all of your interviews, which was the most, uh, I would say, the most exciting interview or the interview that you, maybe you were mostly shocked by that person? You know, it, it's interesting. I think out of all of the interviews, the one that was, I, I, they're all my favorites, right? And there's some <laughs> interviews that did actually, that didn't make the book. Um, but the one that was most shocking, um, I would say, you know, Angie, Angie synthesized something that I hadn't thought about before. So I think what she actually put into words was most shocking. You know, we, we were discussing um, blackface, right? And then she had this, she, we were talking about this idea of literary blackface. And it's something I think we'll be revealing, not just to, um, you know, just re readers, but also um, people who are writers as well. Because, you know, I think the example that we were talking about was, if you're writing a story um, about time travel, right? And you send a character back um, or characters back to the 1940s. Um, you know, let's say they're all white, but because the Black Lives Matter movement took place, you're like, I'm going to make one of the characters black. Well, you also need to rewrite that story now because the black character's experience and then the subsequent experience of everyone involved with the situation is going to change because the 1950s is not the same for a black person as it is for a white person. And, and realistically, no experiences, right? No matter what you write, you cannot write characters who just happen to be black. Yes. Yes, that's that's so true. And I I was just like it the just just cheering in my seat when I when I read that because that is something that people need to know. And that's why the own voices movement is so important. And, and with the Own Voices movement, we, we're seeing a highlight of people writing their own authentic stories so you can truly get a voice. And then like you said, taking that into consideration. And, and I think as a black person, you, you know that immediately. Whereas if you're not Own Voices and you're writing that, you're not thinking about that. You just think, oh, diversity. Let me just add diversity. So I, I think for me, that, that was one of my uh, favorite interviews that you did too. And then I'm a, I'm a huge hip hop fan, uh, a huge, just all my life I've been listening to hip hop and you know, R&B. And so I'm so excited um, about all of the, the information that you're sharing, catching people up who, who may not know about some of these groups. Um, is there a, a group or a song that you really highly recommend to people right now to listen to that um, you think could even further aid in the, um, the education and this anti-racist teaching? You know, I, I always tell people um, Kendrick uh, does a phenomenal job. I think Kendrick has a mainstream appeal, uh, so a lot of people are familiar with him. Um, but outside of him, you know, who I think does a really good um job and not a lot of people are as in as tuned in as I would love Solange Knowles I think yeah. Solange she not only she speaks to a certain level of just blackness right yeah. and I think she gets lost kind of in being Beyonce's little sister yeah. um, 
but they're two different lanes, right? And Solange, you know, like one of the songs that everybody kind of knows is um, Don't Touch My Hair, but generally that is her whole kind of ethos, right? This pro-blackness, um, Afrofuturist kind of visuals and music. And I have the utmost respect for her and, and really the whole family. Yes, and I like what you mentioned about one line that she said that just struck was so powerful to you. Some ish is just for us. And I think that that is, like I said, you have found a way to really bring together hip hop education in a way that I know is going to be beneficial. As a high school librarian, um, many people have, uh, you know, this journey has not been easy. And I know you know this, uh, anytime that you try to, to bring about change, there's going to be some backlash. And so um, in libraries, we do have challenges and we do have people who say, oh, I don't, th I don't want my kids to learn about that or I don't think that they're ready. Um, I, what, what would you say to, the li to a librarian or educator who might be hesitant about having this book in their collection uh, for fear of backlash? You know, um, that's an interesting question. I, I think that what I would say to them is, you know, you have to define who you want to be when people look back at your legacy, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the challenge of you putting something in your library is not nearly as challenging as it is for my face to be on something um, that I'm asking people to change around the world, right? Um, there's a danger in that. You know, I'm asking you to do the easy piece, really. I'm asking you to simply uh, step out and, and use your platform to just educate. And that's what your job is. If you're not educating, you're not actually doing your job, right? Like education isn't always meant to be comfortable. It's meant to be right. It's meant to, it's meant, you're meant to do the right thing. And, and this book, along with The Hate You Give, along with Stamped, along with other books that educate and enlighten is the right thing to do. So at the end of the day, do you want to be an educator or do you want to be comfortable? Mm, wow. I, I, we, need to, we need to take notes and write that down. That is some powerful advice. And I will be quoting you and using that because that, that's something that we come across and I, I feel exactly the way that you do. And I've, you know, just keep per persevering and keep encouraging educators to persevere on this journey. And like John Lewis said, continue to make good trouble. And one of the situations in the book that really, uh, it, and, and it just really struck me and, you know, I had to stop for a second and then come back to the book was uh, Cynthia, one of your friends cries after a racist altercation at a party, she states, all we asked them to do was respect us. Why don't they just respect us? And why do you think it is so hard for people to understand that concept of cultural appropriation? I, I think that cultural appropriation is so hard to understand I'm around the world because we don't really teach nuance, right? We don't teach critical thinking when it comes to race theory oftentimes. We just started getting into this work recently. It's, it's, it's new, I, these are new ideas. So, you know, people understand slavery bad, right? Not everyone, but, you know, <laughs> decent people understand slavery bad, um, Jim Crow bad, but it kind of stops there, right? Oh, people, people were surprised that this year for Thanksgiving, a lot more uh, celebrities and influential people were pushing back against Thanksgiving. Well, why is that a surprise? We need to start teaching earlier as we're doing in this book, you know, some of the nuance of, of race and, and, um, and respect. We don't, we don't really teach that. So it, it's not a surprise to me that people don't get it yet, but that's the work now. That's the work of this book and other books like it, right? Is to start actually pushing for more on race. Not like the simple things like, oh, Christopher Columbus uh, came, no, 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 no. The conversation is Christopher Columbus came here and murdered indigenous people and, and people were here before he didn't discover anything. That, and, and we usually stop it at the first part of Christopher Columbus might not be that great. No, let's talk about it. So, you know, I think that that's the issue is we don't really talk about nuance. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and I think that 
you know, with the with the with the recent uh, repeal, and I think it was Texas where they're trying to go back and take anti-racist teaching, and the students and the teachers are fighting fighting to get that back in the curriculum. It just shows how how much we need this and how timely this is. And a lot of the comments, uh, you know, different things uh, in the book where people were seen offensive. And then there's also uh, references that you make throughout the book. And I was so happy that in the back of the book that you have uh, this encyclopedia of racism. Um, can you talk to us about your encyclopedia of racism and how how you determine what you put into it? And is there anything that you, you know, after the book was published, you were like, man, I should have put that in and in your encyclopedia? You know, it's interesting because if I could have, um, the encyclopedia would have been an actual like encyclopedia, you know, something that was, you know, thousands of pages and it, it could have mm -hmm. been. Um, mm -hmm. The way that we worked on that encyclopedia, you know, was throughout the book, what did I say that inherently people might not get, right? So if, if I brought up the, you know, the Tulsa um, massacre, I'm like, as I'm writing, I'm like, I don't know that people necessarily understand what that is, right? Like I'm saying it in passing, but I think that's oftentimes the mistake that people make when trying to educate or trying to inform is that if you're informing and educating, you have to think through, they don't necessarily know everything that I'm talking about. So with things like that, or things like white privilege, right? white privilege for you and I, simple conversation, right? Like, okay, this is white privilege. But if this is the first time that you are being introduced to something, especially if you're a young reader, then I should define what that is to inform said reading that you're doing. So if you're reading in the first chapter, second chapter, the word white privilege, I don't want you to necessarily have to go online and learn what that is when I can just tell you myself like hey this is what it is um you don't have to go anywhere else but I also give instances of telling people like hey but you can go here and learn from these people also right I wanted it to really be a toolkit and I think it really is and I, I was so excited to see it in the back of the book because uh so many people assume that people know things and they don't and then there's a void left people skim over it or may not and now, you know, you have this, this reference that people can, can look to and follow from. And I also like the Black Friend playlist in the back. And I know we'll have upcoming events where we talk about them, um, but you, you have some great hits on, on this list. And I hope people uh, really take the time to go through and listen to all these songs because I do think they will be enlightened by them. I also wanted to ask you, as a as a writer, as a philanthropist, as an activist, all of these these things that you've done, um, you you started out as this young boy who was looking for answers and, and was was a little naive in the, the beginning. Um, looking back at that younger Frederick, what what would you say to him? What advice would you give to him that? you know, maybe our young readers can take from this experience? I think if I was talking to my young self about race and some of the issues that were troubling me, I, I would say, take your time, right? Like, and I, and, and I think I say this also to anybody who's going to watch this and, and read the book is take your time with everything because we're all still learning. You know, at when I was in my preteens and teens, I wasn't fully, um, you know, woke um, or or you know, someone who understood uh, critical race theory as I do now, and that was okay, right? Because I had to take a journey. And, and I think that that's what I'm offering people even in this book who are not black is a journey. Um, you know, I'm offering educators a journey. I'm offering parents a journey, right? To say like, I didn't always get it right the same way you might not be getting it right, but here's a chance for us all to be better. Yes, wow. And just some fun questions because I have to, I have to ask, uh, you mentioned in the book that 98 degrees was actually the best of boy bands and I will gladly die on that hill. Are you prepared to defend that answer? <laughs> you know, it's funny. So there are people who um, have the art for the book and they already started coming at me on Twitter for this. My boy bands, I specifically meant like, that era of like 
in sync, oh, back okay. not like <laughs> not like new edition and, and people like that, you know. Um, but I am still willing to die on that hill in relation to like in sync and backstreet boys. <laughs> And and then uh, yeah, I'm glad I'm glad. Okay, so you you cleared that up. That makes up. That makes that makes more sense. And um, and also when you talked about friends and the popularity of friends and how uh, we're expected to know all the characters from Friends, and if you don't, it's like. But how many of you know Regine from Living Single or Khadijah and Sinclair and. I just wanted to know your, you know, if you wanted to comment and say anything about the the lack of knowledge. You mentioned we we talked about the encyclopedia, but just the lack of knowledge and the lack of respect for the knowledge that, you know, we have that other people outside of our culture don't have. You know, it's interesting because I I I, I, I even since I wrote the book, um, I've been thinking about this a lot because. When you live in a country that is so centered around whiteness, you have no choice but to learn about said whiteness, right? It, it is literally everywhere you go. So, you know, I've, I've, I've seen Seventh Heaven, I've seen, um, you know, Seinfeld, so on and so forth. Um, but so you get that knowledge and then inherently you have the knowledge from your own culture, right? And your own interests and the people around you. And I think that it's understated how special of an experience that is really, because even as like, let's say a marketer, right? I am a better marketer than most of my colleagues because I come from two different worlds at the same time, right? And I don't think that America has a deep respect for that. Um, you know, that diversity actually has a return on investment for most companies as an example, right? When I come in, I'm not just coming into a room and marketing to black people. I can tell you how to market to white people because I spent my whole life with white people, right? Like re looking at, reading, I've read Huckleberry Finn, all sorts of whatever I'm supposed to read, Jane Austen, but have you read The Coldest Winter? Have you read, um, you know, anything by Octavia Butler? Have you read James yes. Bolton, right? I have both, which makes me inherently better. <laughs> like, yeah, you pre look, you preaching now. I got <laughs> I got to wave my church fan on that. That's so true. And so when you see these ads where there was no consideration of of cultural reference or insensitivity, you I have to wonder was there a person of color or was there any type of diversity at the table? And I think you're exactly right to say that we are benefit. We are beneficial. We are important to the conversation um, because we've had to do something called code switching since the beginning of time. And so I think that's an excellent point. And we need to take a snippet of that and send that to HR reps all over the world. There's another reason or the main reason why you need to hire and include uh, diversity in your uh, company. <laughs> And I have so many questions, but I, 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 I know our time is running short, but I just, I just want to say, you know, I'm a huge fan and I am so grateful for writers like you who, who make my job as a school librarian so much easier. Just looking at this cover, and, and by the way, this cover is amazing, was there you know, before we wrap up, was there any inspiration or anything uh, that inspired the artwork? And um, you want to give a shout out to who created the artwork? Yeah. Um, so the artwork was created by uh, Zaria Shin. Um, and also, so I have um, another cover um, of the book, which if you give me two seconds, um, okay. I will pull up who also created the UK version of the book. And it's important to me because um, both covers were created by black women, right? The person who did that cover, black woman, the person who did um, the UK cover, um, a black woman, and um, the person who's also doing the educator's guide um, is a black woman. And, and you know, um, it means a lot to me to have you on here um, as a black woman who's, who's really, you're the first conversation, um, like the book releases tomorrow, and you're the first conversation I'm having, um, you know, this week about the book. And, and you know, that, that really means the world to me. Nadina Ali um, created the UK version um, of the Black Friend um, cover. And again, you know, the artwork is just a photo of me, like that, that photo, whatever. 
So the artwork <laughs> is very much Zaria um, and her vision. Um, you know, so people who are interested in that artwork or the artwork of the other book, please um, look out for them. Um, hire Black women, listen to Black women, support Black yeah. women. Um, you know, that is um, something that I try to also instill in this book. Um, you'll notice that I primarily talk to women throughout the entire book. Um, and I wanted to do that because I think that it gives, I'm already a man, right? So you have my perspective as a man in the book, um, as a black man, I wanted to platform um, women, um, people from the LGBTQ community, um, you know, people who are not black. Uh, so, you know, that's important to me. So I think when people are reading this, please understand that these perspectives were also um, supposed to be from um, a diverse and eclectic background. And, and I think you accomplished all of that. And I'm so happy to, to hear about all of the inclusion of black women and, and shout out to black women for, for all they've done, all we've done with this, this election, this recent election. And then, and now hearing that uh, Joe Biden is going to have a uh, plethora uh, of women of color in his, uh, his cabinet and in his, um, as far as his communications team. I'm, I'm just so excited and it really feels good as a black woman to, to hear a black man say those things because you do need to hear it. And I think that's something that has been left out of the conversation. And I didn't think I could love you or your work anymore until after you say that. And <laughs> but I do. I, I, I just wanna say thank you for your time. This conversation could continue forever, but I know you're busy and you have a full schedule. I wanna just thank you for writing a Read Woke book. It checks all the check marks of a Read Woke book. I'm excited about getting this book into my collection. I encourage every librarian, every educator, you must buy this book. You must add this to your collection. When you, your funding is in now, go ahead and add this book to your collection. You will not be disappointed. And I would also just like to say um, that um, I just want to thank everyone for uh, listening today and encourage all of you, if you like this conversation, if you're intrigued by the book, uh, to join us in our Candlewick, Candlewick Book Club. And we will be having giveaways, giving away books and totes. And we will also have a hashtag that you can follow, which is Candlewick Read Along and follow the hashtag and follow Frederick Joseph on Twitter, social media. Um, he, is, he's a, he, he teaches and educates through social media in a way that I have not seen done by anyone. And please, please, please read this book, join our conversations and share this book with a friend. And I just wanna thank everyone for joining us today and have a great day. And don't forget to read Woke with the Black Friend. <laughs> Thank you, Cicely. Everyone make sure you follow Cicely on Twitter also at, <laughs> at Cicely the Great because she didn't mention uh, her handle. So make sure you do that. Thank you.